The market place is empty, no more traffic in the street. Builder's tools, they're all silent as the king comes through the gate. Oh, the king is coming, the king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face I see. Oh, the king is coming. Yes, the king is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. Happy faces line the hallways. Those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended. Those from prison he has freed. Little children and the aged. Hand in hand stand all aglow. As the king of all the ages comes to claim his glorious throne. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. The King is coming, the King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the King, he's coming. Yes, the King is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. We're going to be talking today about the subject of the truth concerning the birth of Christ. The truth concerning the birth of Christ. And we're going to start in the Gospel of Luke, and I hope that no one hates me after this sermon, uh, but uh, I, I determined a few weeks ago that it would be a good thing to preach on the truth of his birth. We see so much in our culture that people do that they claim is celebrating the birth of Christ, and uh, we don't see biblical uh, precedents for that, but simply traditions. So we're going to talk about the truth. and. Uh, I only care about trying to edify the people in the truth. So look at chapter 2 of the book of Luke and verse 1. It came to pass in those days that there went a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made with Cyrenius when he was governor and, uh, of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Now, the reason that they were doing this taxing was because of the sovereign plan of God. And here in Luke chapter 2, I'm in verse number 1, I finished. Verse number 2 uh, tells us that they all had to go. Verse 3, all went to, the, to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea which was approximately uh, a 70 mile journey. So it wasn't just an hour or two, it took at least four to five days. 
you would walk at about 2.5 miles per hour and uh, to travel from uh, the area there of Bethlehem to uh, the area of, of Jerusalem today is about a 70 mile trip. So we would assume it would be the same. So they would have spent a lot of time. I want you to notice that there's no mention of a, a, a burrow. It doesn't say that she rode a donkey. But how many times you'll see on cards, Mary riding a donkey. It doesn't say that. You see, to have a donkey, you had to be pretty wealthy. You had to have some money. Most folks didn't have that, and especially Joseph and Mary, because when they went to make the sacrifice, you know what they offered? Two pigeons, two turtle doves. And that was the poorest offering you could make. Normally, folks who were wealthy would, would give a higher sacrifice, but they were very poor. And so, uh, according to what we know from the scriptures, there was no animal she rode. She walked 70 miles, and she was great with child. That means that she was <laughs> pretty big. She would, people would look at her and say, well, you're ready to pop. But she walked 70 miles, and perhaps that even assisted her. I remember when Kathy was having a, a, one of the children and having problems getting the delivery started. They wanted, someone mentioned taking her out and driving her on a bumpy road uh, to try and get it started. We didn't do that, but uh, there was some suggested that. But the Bible says they, they go and Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. Now, now let me say something here. When Mary and Joseph left to go to be taxed, they were not married. Do you know that they did not marry until after the birth of Christ? Many people think that they were married, but they weren't. Because they had never had sexual relations. Joseph had never known Mary in an intimate way. And this is what perplexed her so much when the angel appeared to her and told her, Gabriel told her she was going to have a child, and she said, how can this be because I've not known a man? How do you get pregnant when you... <laughs> There's no way to do that. Well, then he explained to her that this was not going to be something that would be natural. She was going to be uh, conceiving by the Holy Spirit. And the Son of God would be so precious and special in His birth. Now, notice also that the Bible says, verse 6, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. You know, sometimes babies come very unexpectedly, and, uh, but you would think that with this being her first one, that perhaps it would have been a longer labor, but being the Son of God, uh, it, it was different, perhaps, than any other birth that ever happened in the history of man. And notice verse 7. She brought forth her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now, swaddling is something that has become popular in the last 50 years. For a long time, uh, in the 1700s, 1800s, they didn't... Uh, recommend swaddling because in swaddling you restrict the arms and the movement of the child. Some children love this and many have come to the conclusion that swaddling helps a baby to sleep and to feel comforted. And so that's what she did. She wrapped him in these swaddling clothes or pieces of material that were available uh, that were used for many different things. There were a lot of practical uses for pieces of cloth. And so this is what he was wrapped in. And the Bible says that he, uh, she laid him in a manger. Now the word manger there, and I took a lot of time to look at the Greek and the Hebrew, is the word for trough. Uh, 
Those of you who ever lived on a farm, you know what a trough is. You get ready to feed the cattle or your horse. Uh, it's good to have a trough so they don't eat off the ground. A lot of people just pour their feed right on the ground, let the horse pick it out of the ground, but a lot of times they can get different things, and so you have a trough, and you feed your cattle in a trough or your horse. It was a wooden thing, and it would be about the perfect size for a baby. And the Bible tells us that she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, the word in. Circle that in your Bible if you do. The word in, and I will vouch for this. You can look it up in the Greek language. The word in means a guest house. It doesn't mean a hotel. It doesn't mean a motel. In fact, they didn't have those kind of things back in those days. People would have a little room attached to their home where friends or family that would come could stay in this little room. And because it was so small, she needed something bigger because she was in childbirth and there would probably be two or three people trying to help her while she was delivering this baby. Also, you know, we hear about all this no room in the end and, you know, people talk about that, but it's, that's not true. It's not what the Bible teaches us. And the Bible says there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Now remember that uh, the, the shepherds were prevalent in this day. And these shepherds, no doubt, were, were men who were men of God. And the angels appeared to them. Notice that. It's not angels appearing to the wise men. The wise men never once saw an angel. But yet, we look at so many different Christmas scenes and Christmas cards. And by the way, people get all out of shape sometimes by calling it Christmas. But then we go have, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday that are all named after pagan gods. And the all 12 months of the year are named after pagan deities. If you're going to throw a fit over not saying the word Christmas, why not throw a fit about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the months of the year? It's totally inconsistent. Now, we're going to learn some more things as we see here. The Bible says, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so excited. No, they were afraid. You see, these angels were keeping watch over their sheep by night because at night time was when the predators would attack and sometimes there would be thieves who would try to steal their sheep and so they would go in a sheepfold. A sheepfold was like a rock fence about chest high and the sheep would go in there and the shepherd would sleep in the doorway. That's why Jesus said, that I am the door. He used that same analogy in when he was talking about the salvation he would bring to his people. He is the door. And you must come through me. Anyone that comes another way is the same as a thief and a robber. Christ is the only way of salvation. Amen. He is the only way for man to go to heaven. I'm not ashamed to say that. In fact, I'd be willing to die for it. There's only one way that a man or a woman can be redeemed as a sinner, and that is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to their heart by faith, putting you into a state of grace. Listen, if the grace of God is in your life, you will be a new person. You will experience that grace, and it will change you. But now notice, the angel said unto them, Fear not. Verse 10, For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, in a trough. 
That's what you're going to look for. Now, these wise men, or these shepherds, the wise men have not come yet. The shepherds had been in the field. They had been watching their sheep, and when the angel appeared and, and told them all these things, the Bible goes on to tell us that in verse number uh, 13, and suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. And notice this. They were saying. They weren't singing. In fact, as you study your Bible, you will not find angels singing. You will find angels saying. Many believe that singing is something that is reserved only for the redeemed and the Lord himself. Now we see that the Lord sings. Uh, we, we've talked about that before in the Old Testament. It talks about that. But uh, angels say, and they say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. They glorify God. They tell them that a Savior has come. And verse 15, it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another. If you underline in your Bible, underline, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Now there were some things evidently said that the Bible doesn't tell us because the angel simply announced that he was going to come and he was going to bring joy and he was going to bring peace. And the Bible tells us that they go to Bethlehem. Verse 16, they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them one concerning this child. So they were telling everybody, everywhere they went, and all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, let me add something else. There is no mention of animals being here. None. Even though in many of your Christmas scenes, uh, in, in a, a guest house, there were times when they would bring in sheep that were injured or sick. Uh, in those days, many times they would live on an upper deck and underneath the house, there would be like a basement area. And they would bring in the animals if they were sick. But it was not a place where the animals would common or nor ordinarily live. But when the story got told, we went by a nativity scene at uh, just up from our home yesterday, and you know they had all the sheep and the horses and the mules and everything all around little baby Jesus. You might be interested to know that that theory developed in the third and fourth century, when many people who hated the Jews said that animals had more knowledge than the Jews did, and that's why they attached it to the birth of Christ, saying that animals were smarter than they were. Take that for what it's worth. Now, I just did a little digging, thought you might want to know that. Anyway, he says, they, they came with haste, they found them, and all they that heard, they told, and they wondered at these things. Now, I want you to see 19. But Mary did what? Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You see, Mary had known because the angel Gabriel had appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to have a child even though she had never known a man. And Joseph, of course, now you, you imagine Joseph. He's, married, he's, he's a spouse to marry her. They're engaged. And all of a sudden, everybody says, hey, your wife's pregnant. She's showing. And he's going, Wow. We've, we've never had any sort of relationship. There must be a, a, a fox in the hen house. You know, something must be going on. But then the angel appeared to him and said, Listen, no, no, this is not the case. You should not put your wife away because the child that is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. 
The Bible tells us she pondered these things in her heart. And the Bible tells us that the shepherds in verse 20 returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision, circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. Now, there's a whole story behind that because his uh, Zacharias, uh, when they got ready to name him, he had sort of uh, rebuked at the idea of calling him John, and he became mute. and He couldn't hear, he couldn't talk. And so when they asked him, what will the child be called? He wrote on a piece of paper, his name will be called Jesus. Many wanted him to be called Zachariah Jr. But no, John said he'll be called Jesus. And then suddenly, everything came back to normal after he was willing to abide by what God wanted him to understand. Now, the actual birthday of Jesus is not December 25th. And you should know that. Uh, there are two different theories about how the 25th was picked. Some say that it was attached to a pagan ritual. Because during this time there would be festivities and rituals of pagan nature. And because it coincided with the 25th, they picked that day. Now I don't lean to that. I lean more to this conclusion. Many believe that from the time of his crucifixion, they went back nine months and they dated it the 25th of December, giving nine months for his birth. And I think that is perhaps the most accurate uh, understanding of what occurred. It was not December the 25th. Most scholars believe that it would have been probably earlier, uh, probably in maybe November or perhaps maybe in, in March because uh, the shepherds did not go out into the fields when it was cold winter time. It was too cold for them. But nevertheless, we don't know when he was born. The Bible does not tell us the exact day. In fact, we don't even know the exact year. Scholars argue between, uh, the, between uh, 4 A.D. to 6 A.D. for his birth. Men don't keep count really good, do they? I mean, they mess up on all kinds of things. And so the fact is he came, right? We know he came. We know he was born of a virgin. But we don't know what day that was. But it's good to be thankful and celebrate. And I want you to understand, I am no, I am no Scrooge. And I'm not mad or I'm not grouchy about all this. I just want to tell you what really happened. Because I think people need to know what really happened. Amen. Now, we'll go on and we'll look at a few more things. The truth is we're not told where he was born, nor are we commanded to celebrate his birth. Do you know we're commanded to celebrate his death and his resurrection? fact, in the ordinances of the church, we're, when, we, when we practice baptism, it's a celebration of the resurrection. When we observe the Lord's Supper, it's a celebration of his death, burial, and resurrection. But nowhere are we told to celebrate his birth. I don't, I'm not saying that we shouldn't. There are lots of things silent in the Bible, but just something to think about. Now, I want to tell you about that word, uh, in. The Greek word for end that's translated here is the Greek word kataluma. If you have a Strong's Concordance and you do much study in your Bible, you can look up kataluma and you'll see that kataluma does not mean end. It means a guest quarters or a guest house. Most likely Joseph and Mary stayed with the family, but the room was too small to have a child. And so they gave birth in a main room of the house where there were animal troughs and they were handy, so they used them. Now, the Bible tells us there in verse 7 that she brought forth her firstborn and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Now, let's, uh, let's explore something else. Turn with me now, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, please. 
Matthew chapter 1, we're going to notice uh, beginning in verse 18, we're going to get a, a different uh, perspective of the birth of Christ, and we're going to learn some things that will help us all to be edified. The Bible says in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, but you know what they did with women back in those days who committed adultery? They put them to death. They stoned them. They also stoned the men who were caught committing adultery. Look at our world today. Look at how we have deviated. Adultery is looked upon as nothing anymore. We were having a conversation uh, this week with a certain lady, and she was talking about a man who got another woman pregnant, and she said, yeah, he had a little indiscretion. <laughs> and I said, a little indiscretion, huh? Yeah, that's more than a little indiscretion. That is adultery. And the Bible tells us that when you commit adultery, uh, you bring a curse, you bring judgment upon your life. It's very important that a husband and a wife be faithful and pure to one another. No other woman or no other man should have any part with them when it comes to the conjugal bed and the marriage. It's between a husband and a wife. Now the Bible tells us that verse uh, number 10, when they saw the star, uh, let's look up a little bit before that. Uh, let's look at verse number uh, 4. And when he gathered all the scribes together, scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Now this was Herod. Herod was a king. And a lot of the dating of the birth of Christ depends upon when Herod died. And many believe he died in 2 AD. However, the Bible says, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. You'd think, well, he really wants to know where this Savior is going to be. But they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. Now, even though they told him that was Bethlehem of Judea, there were a number of Bethlehems in that day, and there were different uh, things that would have confused Herod, or he would have immediately sent his soldiers to put Christ to death. But the Bible says, They said unto him, In Bethlehem, Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So the Lord had prophesied 700 years before the birth of Christ that his son would come out of Bethlehem, Judah. That was the smallest of all the, the tribes of Judah, of all the different families. He's called the least. Isn't that the way God works? God usually goes to the most destitute place to choose people to serve Him. And He calls them from afar. Though they may not be the ones that have the greatest education or the greatest talent, they have a heart for Christ. And that's what makes all the difference. Amen. And the Bible says in verse Number seven, then Herod, when he had probably called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. A number of commentaries believe that this magi, these magi, do you notice that there weren't three? There's no way to know how many there were. When I was in uh, uh, high school, I used to sing every year from my freshman year, We three kings of Orientar. 
And I had no idea that I was singing a lie. We don't know that there were three kings. There weren't kings at all. They were magi. And most people believe that this magi were, had wisdom passed down from the prophet Daniel when he had been in Babylonian captivity and had written the book of Daniel he actually pinpointed the, the time when Christ would be born and so by studying the scriptures these magi knew of the traditions and everything about Daniel and they believed he was a man of God and they came following the star from the east now, some people say it was a comet. They want to explain away the supernatural. But I, I think from the things that I've read, it was the Shekinah glory of God. It was the glory of God appearing, showing these wise men where he would be born. Verse 9, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, a comet doesn't do that. This star is leading them. And when it comes to the home, hey, think about this. It wasn't a barn. It wasn't a manger. And he's no longer a baby. He's a young child. He's perhaps as old as three or four years old. And the Bible tells us in verse number 11, and when they were come into the what? Are you kidding me? The house. When they were come into the house, they saw, and if you underline in your Bible, they saw the young child. He could have been about Brooke's age or Lindley's age. He's a child. The word technon there means a young child. And so he was, he was not a babe in a manger. And when these wise men came, the magi came, they came and the Bible says that star pointed them directly to the house. And notice this, with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him, now this is where they get three men, they presented gold, they presented frankincense, and they presented myrrh. And these three gifts all represent different spiritual truths. Some say that myrrh represents preservation. Frankincense here refers to worship and praise of God. And the gold is an offering of royalty. A king. That's who he was. Christ was a king. He was the king of kings. He was the Lord of lords. He was God of all creation. Amen. And no wonder they fall down and they worship Him. And when they had opened their treasures, they gave Him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now why do you think that happened? Let me tell you why. Because Herod the king would send out a decree that every child that was two years old and younger should be put to death. Now that does seem to indicate that the Lord could have been about two. However, there are some who disagree with that, but I'm not saying that we should. I'm just telling you as, as best I can what the Scripture says. But why do you think He gave them all these things? Well, gold, number one, was very expensive. I mean, they could use that. You know why? They were going to have to flee to Egypt. Because the Bible said, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And Jesus was going to have to go from Bethlehem, Judea, unto Egypt. And Mary and Joseph made their journey. And, and perhaps by this time they could have bought a burl. Because they have gold. And they have frankincense and they have myrrh. And those things all were very valuable. And in that day and time, it sort of put them on a, a, a middle class plane to, to, to being rich. But they needed that money in order to make that long journey all the way into Egypt, which was quite a journey. And the Bible tells us in uh, verse 12, being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. 
And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and do what? Flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now I'm going to add something here because I don't have time to really get into it here, but uh, they stayed in Egypt until Herod died, but they couldn't come back then because Herod's son became the king. And he was more bloodthirsty than Herod was. He had 3,000 Jews executed in one day over some petty issue. He was as bloodthirsty as he could be. And so they waited. And as we read more about it, the Bible tells us in verse 15, And they were there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was wroth, exceeding wroth, set forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently uh, required, uh, inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, In Ramna was there a voice heard, lamentations and weeping and great mourning. Uh, some of the historians say that there could have been as many as four or five hundred children put to death at the, at the birth of Christ soon afterwards. Some say it was as small as 70. There's, uh, there's differences in historical opinion about that. But the Bible tells us that uh, they had to seek another way uh, according to Scripture. And uh, the voice was heard of mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. Verse 19, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. But notice, he rose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archimelius, that's Herod's son, did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod. He was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. Now Galilee was out of the reach of Herod and his son. His son who was reigning at this time, uh, Arch Archelaus, uh, would not have had absolute power in this area of Galilee. And he came and dwelled in a city called Nazareth that it, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. He shall be called a Nazarene. That is, he came from Nazareth. And that would fulfill the prophecies. Uh, so we've looked at uh, lots of important things concerning this. Uh, we, uh, Mary did not ride, as we said, on a donkey. Uh, perhaps only when they went to Egypt when they had money. And animals that appeared in the nativity started in the 4th century. And bringing animals into the churches for the nativity, you know when that started? That started in the 12th century by a man named Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi was a Roman Catholic monk. And he wanted the people to experience these things in a personal way, so he literally brought in these nativity scenes for people to see. And they became another type of idol for people to look at and worship rather than worshiping Christ. The true churches rejected this and would have nothing to do with that sort of thing. There are many false traditions. The truth is that the Lord Jesus Christ is a biblical historical story. We remove the stable, we remove the animals, we remove all of these different things that are traditions. We take away the end and what are we left with? Jesus of history was a child born to a Jewish family under a foreign regime. The Roman Empire controlled 
the nation of Israel. They were heavily taxed, and every movement they made was directed by the Roman Empire. He was born into this family, living away from home and his family. He fled from a king who sought to kill him because of politics. You know why Herod wanted him dead? Politics. He heard there's a king born. I'm king. There's no room for two kings. So he wants to kill him. You think folks won't kill people over politics? <laughs> That's been going on since mankind started. They'll kill you over politics. And right now in America is one of the most dangerous times for us to say, I'm a conservative. And I believe what the Bible teaches about truth and about living. And you'll be hated and very well may be persecuted for your stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture claims that God became a man in the form of one who was vulnerable, who was poor, who was displaced to unveil the injustice of a tyrannical power while there is nothing wrong with devotion and piety of Christ and his birth, those who have whitewashed it and made up all these traditions, I think we do a disservice to our children by teaching them things that are not true. Joseph and Mary were used of God and the Lord Jesus Christ was born into this world born of a virgin. Now there's another uh, gospel we could look at to gain more, but I think our time is gone, and I pray it's been a blessing to you. Thank God that we have a Savior who came into this world, who uh, lived a perfect life. He lived without sin. He died on the cross. He was buried. He was resurrected. He ascended to the heavens. And the angel said, This same Jesus that you have seen go into the heaven shall so come again in like manner as you've seen him go. Let's stand together, please. Amen.